Good evening, dear Astronomers Without Borders, and welcome to this new event for the Global Astronomy Month 2015. We are very happy to connect with you all over the world from Rome, Italy, for this uh, new uh, special uh, production that we have uh, created together with Angelina Yershova, uh, along with a project called Astro Concert uh, that we have been uh, working together since about 2008. Uh, you may remember last year we uh, sent on air our performance called Aurora Borealis, dedicated to the Northern Lights. And now we come back to you with a, a new production, uh, and uh, we composed and created it specifically for the Global Astronomy Month. In fact, let me thank uh, Daniela De Paulis from Astronomer Without Borders and the whole organization for inviting us to produce this event for the Global Astronomy Month 2015. Um, <clears throat> I'm particularly proud to um, be with you, and uh, let me introduce uh, your hosts for tonight. There will be Angelina Yershova from Kazakhstan, who is a, a musician and composer of uh, electronic music uh, of several different kinds. You will hear that later. Uh, as uh, for myself, I'm Stefano Giovanardi, and I'm one of the astronomers of the Planetarium of Rome. Uh, it's it's uh, for me uh, sad to tell you that the Planetarium is still closed after more than one year, and this is actually uh, really shameful for the city of Rome not to take care at all of its own Planetarium. We should all do something about this, including signing a petition online that you can find on change.org, if you like, to support us. Aside of this, we come back on uh, what we are bringing to you tonight, which is an a astro concert, so a multimedia project, uh, including uh, original music and uh, scientific narration, dedicated to comets, and of course, in particular, to the Rosetta mission, exploring comet uh, Churim of Gerasimienko. We will revisit the comet in a kind of personal way, inviting all of you to um, be uh, within the, the shoes of the, of the probe, so to take uh, your personal journey towards a comet. I don't want to take more time uh, to the concert itself, so let me wish you um, a good uh, uh, Global Astronomy Month, and also especially enjoy this new astro concert called Icy Rose 67P. I have been watching the sky for 30 years now with my telescope and I lost count of how many stars I have seen but I will never forget some of them these are my comets I was waiting for them hiding behind my telescope almost like I had to make an ambush to observe, draw and photograph my comets. I followed them year by year, welcoming any new comet as a surprise, a personal discovery, an implicit promise of wonder. Anytime I pointed my telescope, I could hope for the most fascinating vision the sky had ever offered to me. We never know how a comet will look like, and as a new one is announced, an intimate countdown runs at the increase of its magnitude. Throughout all these years, I assembled a nice collection of comets, and I remember each of them, clear blades of light, messengers of wonder, glittering before my eyes just if uh, all the beauty of the universe could be for a moment concentrated right there in the magnificent flowing of their tails. To tell the truth, I remember very well also the cold, the lack of sleep that I more than once I suffered to observe them. It's the price to pay for cosmic events. And often 
even often I remember quite a strong ache in my neck, so stiff, because of a, a natural and uncomfortable position that I had to hold at my telescope. log in all my astronomical observations. Among those notes written with a student and writing, here are the drawings of my comets. I saw Comet Halley when I still was a teenager back in 1986. I followed it for several months as it crossed the half of the sky, changing its tail and shaking it like a lizard. I enjoyed its evolution until I could burst with joy when I could see the packet by the naked eye at the end of April in the constellation crater. I remember Comet Bradfield, quite a modest one indeed. However, it was the first that I could photograph. And again, Comet Austin, Comet Liller, Comet Borrelly, Comet Macholtz, then Ikea Zhang, Holmes, Pan Stars, and several others. Every year, star lovers search through celestial handbooks and ephemerides in hope that they announce the return of some famous comet, like the Swift Tuttle in 1992, returning after 162 years. However, most of the times comets arrive with short warning and whether they will become astonishing. If they will be visible by the naked eye and display a long tail, well, that remains absolutely unpredictable. Perhaps the most beautiful of all remains Comet Yakutake, with its tail extending over more than half of the sky in March 1996, it became one of the three most impressive visions that I ever saw in the sky. I will never forget the majestic Comet Hale Bob, during its long naked eye visibility, I could watch it under completely different skies and landscapes, from Romagna to Montana, and even from the window of an airplane. I was lucky enough to catch a quick sight of Comet McNaught in 2006, right above the dome of St. Peter's in Rome, just before it sunk toward the southern skies. How envious was I for the superlative display that it put up for the people of the other hemisphere. In Italian, the popular name for these elegant stars with a tail is Stella Cometa. It is a completely wrong name, mixing together two totally different bodies, a star and a comet. But if we know the stars are huge spheres of hot gas, what exactly are comets? Ghosts of light? What do they look like from up close? Well, until a few months ago, we didn't really know. surface of a comet, the first touch of a comet, the long-awaited selfie that the lander Philae took on November 12 last year as it landed 
on Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko after seven hours of free fall. Look at it. Would you ever imagine that a comet from up close looks like that? Since we have in mind those cute clouds of round, round soft light, I really don't believe so. Yet, this rough scene is where the first human probe ended up landing. An unexpected scenario for an unpredictable bounce. The harsh sound that you can hear was the noise of the touchdown. The sound of the comet as it came in contact with Phyllis' legs. Its reaction to a human touch. This jagged panorama could change at any further look and may not be able to hold for long its foreign visitor. All those rocks, boulders and edges instead of white and smooth eyes. Indeed, the first postcard ever sent from a comet seems to arrive from quite a kind, different kind of a celestial body. And what we used to call a dirty snowball turns out to be one of the darkest objects in the solar system as it reflects only 6% of sunlight. It took Rosetta several twisted orbit to find a suitable position to deploy Phile over the desired landing site at Gilkia. Nevertheless, Comet 67P gave uh, uh, Phile quite a bumpy welcome. Nobody knew how hard a surface the lander would hit. But as the harpoons failed to anchor it to the comet, after the touchdown, Phile kept uh, jumping up to one kilometer high and flipping like a flea for over one hour. It was a game of lightweights. In the slim gravity field of 67P, Phile fell down with the weight of a feather. Its final resting place remains unknown, but sure enough, it is lying in a very uncomfortable, unbalanced position. Just as it's up, it happened to me with my telescope, for Phile it must have been quite a pain in the neck to explore its comet. Yet, for about 60 hours, the array of instruments of Phile did a good job analyzing the hostile environment of 67P.
shows up as a desperate bright pixel among the rocks. Will it wake up again? This isn't the first time we see the nucleus of a comet. In the past, at least five comets were visited by other missions. The first image of a nucleus was that of Halley's from another European mission, Joton. It revealed how the graceful tails of comets arise from irregular bodies of ice, similar to huge icebergs floating between the orbits of the planets. But this is the first time we dare to touch a comet. Touching the unknown is a threatening experience. If standing before you is one of the oldest objects in the solar system, touching it is, one of, is an ancestral contact between ages separated by billions of years. It reminds the shivering of the astronauts on the moon when they touched the mysterious monolith in Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey. The unknown surface of Comet 67P represents another kind of, of monolith. The Rosetta Stone. It was used to understand the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. 2,000 years after it was carved, we sent the Rosetta mission to decrypt the birth of the solar system. Sitting in front row before a comet is a unique privilege. But how did we manage to get there? In the first place, Rosetta seems to be following 67P as if it were in orbit around the comet. But it isn't, really. Rosetta simulates an orbital motion. Because the gravity of uh, the comet is too weak to hold uh, the probe as an artificial satellite. In fact, Rosetta is still ro revolving around the Sun. The flight controllers at ESA arranged a sequence of elliptical arcs to bring Rosetta as close to the, its target and keep it near the comet, simulating the behavior of a satellite. Navigating around the comet is not an easy task. Rosetta's approach to Comet Churium of Gerasimenko results in a surprising performance, a triangular breakdance made of sudden twists, quick jumps and triple flips. We had never seen a probe move like that before. Every side of the triangle is a segment of an ellipse centered on the sun. Only as Rosetta nears into the nucleus, it feels the grip of its gravity and the triangle rounds up into circular ripples. Overall, the edgy orbit of Rosetta produces what could be labeled as a cubist drawing. Picasso might be fond of it. Space exploration generated a geometrical dance. The triangular spiral of a vulture upon its prey 
or perhaps the nervous flight of a mosquito around the lamp. When Rosetta performed its closed flyby to the comet, it skimmed merely 8 kilometers above its surface. This happened on Valentine's Day. After seven months of intense courtship, finally Rosetta stole a kiss. Perhaps the choice of the date was not meaningless. After the flyby, Rosetta's pilots at ESA control room adjusted its trajectory with another set of maneuvers, resulting this time in a remarkable square orbit like a castle. That is space cubism again. Let's have a look at the comet with the eyes of Rosetta. By eyes, I mean an array of 10 scientific instruments that have been designed to maximize the probe's capability to tell us everything about Comet 67P. Rosetta gazes upon the comet from all perspectives and at multiple wavelengths, composing an elaborate portrait of its host. What are the main scientific results? of Rosetta's investigation, spying on every side of this duck-shaped comet. As months go by and they travel together toward the sun, Rosetta's instruments measure the increase of the activity of the comet. Thus the mission is producing spectacular filaments extending away from the nucleus. They rise from scattered regions of the surface, like the happy region, the thin neck between the two lobes, that so far proved to be the most active area. Finally, we can even see where the comet's tail begins. It is almost as magic as discovering where the rainbow ends. In five months, the sensors on board of Rosetta detected 193 particles and 853 dust grains. This dust flies toward the probe at the gentle speed of one meter per second. Something like a snowfall. Think how it must feel to be slowly covered by the comet's snow and keep counting the flakes.
Perhaps the most intriguing result obtained by Rosetta concerns water. We expected it to cover the entire comet with ice, which is not. But it gets even more interesting. The isotopic composition of water on comet 67P is different from water on Earth. This means that the comet's water is not the same that makes our seas wet. We used to think that one of the primary sources for water on Earth were comets that fell on our planet long ago, but we, we needed to change our mind. That may not be the only shift of paradigm that this comet will push. As I contemplate the broken landscapes of this beautiful comet, I cannot help thinking of Rosetta as a talented interplanetary Ansel Adams. Its black and white pictures of Churim of Gerasimenko define a new standard in portraying celestial bodies. Along with its charm, we are learning to decrypt comets with Rosetta. There will definitely be even more to come as we fly along with it toward perihelion and the sun in August. On the trail of comet Churim of Gerasimenko, our knowledge of comets is sublimating to higher levels. We begin decoding their hidden truths and continue exploring their intimate nature. Finally, we are ready to catch the icy rose. With caution, because it is fragile and precious. With audacity, because this is a sacrilege. This comet, the icy rose, is for us the current version of the biblical apple. Will we also be able to feel how it smells? What was a welcome selfie becomes a goodbye. As Rosetta flies backward towards its home planet, let's try to imagine how we lose our knowledge about this comet, step by step, from a super detailed panorama of pits and bumps on the comet's surface, to barely distinguishing its bizarre two-lobe shape, to just a tiny point in the sky, hardly noticeable. Remember, that this is what Comet 67P, Churium of Gerasimianco, was for all of us until just a few months ago. And what all the other comets still are in our imagination. Their shapes and rotation, their colors and active regions, 
the topography of the rugged surfaces, a complete mystery. We should not forget that what we know today is the epilogue of an idea that someone expressed like a daydream almost 20 years ago. Let's go to a comet. It took 10 years and 6.6 billion kilometers to make it come true. This mission even had to change destination. Originally, it should have visited comet Virtanen. Rosetta's journey was a gravitational flipper. It included two flybys of the Earth, one of Mars, and even two asteroids, Lutetia and Steins. For three years, Rosetta was even switched off in hibernation. It is endearing how this journey of knowledge wraps up in a white cloud of gas burning on the launch pad when Rosetta was launched in 2004. We are back on Earth now, knowing nothing about comets. They go back to their ghostly nature, mesmerizing humans with their glowing tails, staring at them in awe and terror. We return to our primordial look based on ignorance and superstition. It is a look of fear, fear of the sky and of the unknown. Throughout history, comets have been recorded, followed, chased with much attention and deference for fear of what they may bring. In every court of the world, astronomers and astrologers were in charge of interpreting their messages. But only two times, the comets were read as a good omen. The first one appeared in the year 44 before Christ, after the death of Julius Caesar. It was one of, one of the brightest comets ever seen, and Emperor Augustus associated it to the soul of Caesar being lifted up to the heavens. The second comet is the infamous star that announced the birth of Jesus. The Italian painter Giotto portrayed it in the shape of a comet in the year 1304 after watching a passage of Halley's comet. Thus, he invented the myth of the Christmas comet. Aside of them, comets have always haunted the skies of Earth above a terrified mankind as tragic symbols of bad luck, leaving behind them a long stream of curses and damnations because they were accused of bringing to the world the worst wars, famine, epidemics, catastrophes. With their indifferent beauty, comets were the incarnation of evil, the wrath of the gods punishing a sinful humanity. Comets have always been the evil stars by definition, the black beasts of humanity. 
in a sense, their apparitions are a way to keep a chronicle of all the tragedies of human history. And although astronomers succeeded in understanding the celestial nature and the periodic motion of comets thanks to the intuition of Edmund Halley, his very own comet was able to scare humans to death until its second to last return in 1910. Then Halley's comet would come so close to the Earth to embed, envelop the planet with its tail. The drama started when astronomers discovered that cyanide was among the gases contained in the, in the tail and in the coma. It was instant panic. The most famous comet was back to poison the world. When its tail streaked by the Earth on May 18, 1910, all humanity held their breath. In a and the hysteria became, for the first time, global. In America, the sales of anti-gas masks literally rocketed to the sky. In Chicago, someone started selling Portento's anti-comet pills. In Boston, they rang fire alarms at the sight of the comet. While in New York, they threw comet parties on hotel roofs. Satirical postcards from France and Germany illustrated the desperate escape of men towards the moon uh, on board of unlikely zeppelins. But the day after, all of mankind still could take a full breath. The deadly caress of Halley's comet to the Earth had not been that poisonous in the end.
By now, we have developed some affection for those little beasts with head and tail that comets are. Maybe we should take them out for a walk along their orbits. Where do comets come from? Probably from a huge reservoir of icy nuclei embedding the entire solar system, the Oort Cloud. It extends up to one light year from the Sun. Over there, at least a hundred billion comets slowly move in silence since five billion years and they never did anything else. Comets are frozen books on the origin of the solar system until some star nearby may push them toward the Sun. Then their long journey begins, a never-ending fall that cannot be stopped, a constant acceleration that seems never to grow speed. It can take millions of years for a comet to fall, but as they zip by the Sun at perihelion, their turnaround only takes a few hours. Then they go away, maybe forever, following their paths, perhaps open, perhaps closed. They are parabolic, hyperbolic, or immense ellipses stretching to infinity. We have all seen the deadly fall of Comet Ison two years ago. It was its first trip to the center of the solar system and turned out to be the last. Comet Ison came directly from the Oort cloud. Its fall had begun millions of years ago, when the early ancestors of Homo sapiens still had a long way to go to discover fire and the wheel and knew nothing about the stars. With such weird orbits, where do comets dare to go? Sometimes even inside the Sun, the Kreutz comet family called Sun Grazers is made of fragments of an old comet that exploded and they are all doomed to fall inside the Sun, never to come back. Comets travel in space at their own risk, as they are easy prey of the gravity of stars and planets that can dramatically change their orbit, throwing, throwing them toward entirely new regions tearing their nuclei in pieces or pulling them to crash on a planet. But behind this highly dangerous existence, comets keep their secret. This is what makes them able to explore over time places so distant and diverse. Comets may even migrate from one planetary system to another, only to end up falling on some planet like they did here on Earth. For this reason, we are beginning to think of comets in a new key no longer carriers of death, but of life. They may be the vectors propagating in space the basic seeds of life. This is the idea of panspermia. So now, let's imagine to ride our own mental comet, from aphelion to perihelion. Let's feel its acceleration on a breathtaking journey at increasing speed. Once in our lifetime, let's feel what it means to be a comet.
observed the cute comet Lovejoy gliding through the winter sky from Lipus to Andromeda. And this summer I may aim my telescope right at comet Churyum of Gerasimienko. We will never get tired of comets, I am sure. And while we eagerly wait for the next one, we may wonder what remains of them. What do they leave behind? Besides a sense of wonder in our eyes, where do their tails go? All that gas and dust dispersed by the nucleus, do they vanish forever? No. Even long since they are gone, comets are still able to delight us in the, sh in the fascinating legacy of shooting stars. They still come to us in the form of meteors. All those glittering trails that zip across the sky are nothing else than the debris of some comet, or better said, the remains of their ancient tails. Every year the Earth crosses the orbit of several comets and runs through the stream of particles that they left behind during their former passes around the Sun. All of a sudden, we realize that what man has feared for millennia shares the very same nature of what we trust so much to give away our wishes. The dust grains collected by Rosetta on Comet 67P are the same that burn up in the atmosphere to catch our dreams as shooting stars. In fact, here is the deepest meaning of the word desire, from the Latin desidera, to take from the stars. Despite their history of damnation, we understood that comets do deliver a message to humanity, one of a special kind. They can unveil the origin of the solar system and perhaps of life. This is the message that Rosetta is taking from the stars for us. By touching the comet, we have exorcised the black beast. Now that you know what it is, you are free to choose whether whispering to it your best wishes. We caught the icy rose. Before it melts away, hold your breath and try to grasp its edgy grace, fragile memory of our origins.
We thank you so much for sharing this experience with us, this Astro concert that took us uh, on a really different world, in a sense, for uh, an unexpected kind of a journey. At least we hope so, that it was the same thing for you. We thank you that you followed us from all over the world, perhaps. We will be happy to receive your feedback, your questions, your curiosities. If you just want to write to us, you can connect with us on the Astro Concert page on Facebook, or you can uh, send an email to Astro Concerto, because it ends with a final O, dot, uh, uh, at gmail.com. So again, Astro Concert with an O at the end, at gmail.com, to write to us. And also, we want to, uh, to spe send special thanks to the uh, organization of Astronomers Without Borders, to the Groove Farm Studio that hosted the performance with wonderful professionality, and also to the public that we invited here in the studio to follow us from close by, like File on the jury of Gerasimenko. We hope to en you enjoyed the IC concert, uh, the IC Rose concert of this year, and we, we thank you once again. Hopefully we will reconnect for our future performances with the Global Astronomy Month. Thank you very much. This is all from Rome. Goodbye. <laughs>